In this video, we're going to prove the squeeze theorem. So let's say we have three functions. We have a function called g, and then we have a function called f, and then we also have another function called h. And we know that g of x is smaller than or equal to f of x, which is always smaller than or equal to h of x. And then we're also further given that the limit as x tends towards c for h of x, this exists and it's equal to l. And the same goes for the function g, as x tends towards c for g of x. This limit also exists and it's equal to L. And what I want to prove in this video is that the limit as x turns towards C for f of x, given all this information over here, we can immediately conclude that the limit as x tends towards C for f of x is also equal to L. So this is what we want to prove in this video. And in order to represent this graphically, uh, you can kind of represent everything in such a way. So you have your x-axis, and let's say this point over here is C, and then you have a function, let's say this is the graph of g of x, and then let's say this is the graph of h of x, and then let's say this is the graph of f of x. So you see that f of x is always trapped between h of x and g of x, and then as x tends towards c, you can see that both the functions h and g tends towards the value l, and then what I want to prove is that uh, given all of the, these conditions over here, uh, f of x must always have a limit as x tends towards c, and it must be equal to l. So in order to prove this statement, we need to establish the epsilon delta definition. So we can start off by first noting that these two limits exist. So what that means is that for whatever value of epsilon that I come up with, I know that first of all there must exist values delta 1 and delta 2, which are both larger than 0, such that when x minus c is smaller than delta 1, then this immediately implies that g of x minus l is smaller than epsilon. And then I also know that x minus c, if it's smaller than delta 2, then I immediately know that h of x minus l is smaller than epsilon. So for whatever value of epsilon that you come up with, I know that these values delta 1 and delta 2 must exist because I know already for a fact that these two limits exist. So there must always be values delta 1 and delta 2 such that if the, these conditions are met then these two statements are true. And then now I'm going to define a new symbol called delta that's equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. And since delta is the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, I know that if x is a value such that x minus c is smaller than delta, then it's immediately implied that both of these statements are true because delta is the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2 so if x satisfies this statement over here, then both of these are automatically satisfied. And so both of these statements will be automatically true. So if x minus c is smaller than delta, then I know for a fact immediately that g of x minus l must be smaller than epsilon, and h of x minus l must also be smaller than epsilon. So this is something that we're going to be uh, using in order to complete our proof. So now we know that when x minus c is smaller than delta, we know that these two statements are immediately true. So I'm going to rewrite them in a slightly different way. So instead of using an absolute value, I'm going to express, first of all, this g of x minus l as being between uh, negative epsilon and epsilon. So this is just a different way of expressing the same exact statement. I'm just getting rid of the absolute value sign, and we know that g of x minus l must be between negative epsilon and positive epsilon. And the same goes for h of x. So we know that if this condition is true, then it immediately implies that both this statement is true as well as this statement is also true. So we know that both of these uh, expressions are between negative epsilon and positive epsilon. And then it is also immediately implied, I'm just going to add L to each one of these uh, terms. It's going to be implied that L minus epsilon will always be smaller than G of X, which will always be smaller than L plus epsilon. And the same goes for H of X. So L minus epsilon is smaller than H of X which is smaller than L plus epsilon. And then now I'm going to use the fact that we know that h of, uh, f of x is always between g of x and h of x. And then we know that from here, we know that g of x is always larger than L minus epsilon. So for this entire statement, I can always also add this L minus epsilon over here. Because if I know that if x minus c is smaller than delta, then it's immediately true that g of x is always larger than L minus epsilon. And the same goes for h of x. I can impose this upper bound upon h of x. I know that h of x must always be smaller than L plus epsilon. 
And then from this entire statement over here, now I can drop these two uh, g of x and h of x terms, and then we'll get l minus epsilon is smaller than f of x, which is smaller than l plus epsilon. And then I'm going to subtract l from each one of these terms, so I get f of x minus l is trapped between negative epsilon and positive epsilon. And of course I can now use our absolute value sign to express this as f of x minus l is smaller than epsilon. And so basically this concludes our proof. So we have just shown that for whatever arbitrary, uh, arbitrary value of epsilon that you come up with, we can indeed find a delta, such that if x minus c is smaller than delta, then it's implied that f of x minus l is smaller than epsilon. And in this case, delta is going to be defined in such a way. And so there we have it. We have essentially proved that this limit is also true, provided that we have these conditions.